So when Jill emailed me, uh, she wanted to know if I would come up and uh, give a little presentation about what we did with our coal cell penicillin research and how FSIS has changed their methodologies and whatnot. So uh, the title sounds long and somewhat boring, but it's really about what FSIS is doing, how we uh, did some research, how Chekhov funded some research to figure out how do we solve some of these issues, and then where do we go from here and give you some updated incidents of, of residue violations out there. So kind of the outline for this presentation is We'll talk about, we've got one slide on FSIS testing. So what did they do that impacted us where we had to do some research or fund some research on penicillin withdrawal times? We'll go over that. We'll go over their national residue program because there's some major changes in there that impact pork production. We'll go over the incidences, have some fact sheets for you if you want to look at those, and then answer any questions. Even though I have questions at the end, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. That's pretty good. Because if you're like me, if I have a question at the beginning of the presentation, I'll forget it at the end. So please ask it throughout the presentation. So what did FSIS do that changed, that uh, increased our penicillin residues in sows? Well, back in 2011, <clears throat> they changed their screening methodology. And we'll kind of get into the, the cascade of events that FSIS does when they test for uh, residues. But in 2011, they changed their screening methodology those are two acronyms up there. FAST is FAST Antimicrobial Screening Test. They changed that to a KISS test, which is a kidney inhibition swab test. The reason they changed this is because in 2012, they were going to completely convert to the KISS test. So they wanted to test the KISS and compare it to the FAST and see what the differences were and make sure it was applicable and applied throughout the industry. And this wasn't just a swine industry. They did it all across beef and pork. In that time frame, they also changed with how they confirm positives. So again, that's another is that, uh, HPLC double mass spec. Again, that's not very important other than what that says is they're getting more sensitive. These methodologies that they're coming up with are becoming more sensitive and trying to find lower levels of antibiotics in all types of uh, meat out there. So what that did was is once they changed those two methodologies, we saw a substantial increase in penicillin residues for sows. And if you remember, uh, FDA, FSIS have a zero residue tolerance for penicillin. So any amount of penicillin found in pork meat, um, which is different than beef and poultry because there is a tolerance of beef and poultry, but with sows or with pork, there's a zero tolerance. So if you remember when I said they, their, their methods are becoming more sensitive, so we're chasing zero. If you think back when penicillin was first introduced to the market in the 40s or 50s, the archaic methodology used to determine withdrawal times and, and tolerances is, is completely horrendous compared to this HPLC double mass spec sensitive system. So we're chasing zero. The, the systems are becoming more sensitive. So what do we need to do? We need to fund some checkoff, needed to fund some research to figure out what's the real withdrawal time for sow, uh, penicillin use in sows. So we had a couple questions out there when we was looking at the uh, research. We know what the labeled dose is, one cc is 100 pounds a pig, seven day withdrawal time. It's typically a 10 cc injection site. But what we found out is a typical use is an extra label use, five cc is 100 pounds, uh, usually a 20 cc injection site volume because you don't want to have to stick that girl any more than you have to. And then there's an extended withdrawal time of 14 days. So what we didn't know is, is is it the in injection site volume that's creating these positives that we're seeing out there? Because we haven't seen these positives in the past. Or could it be that the volume or the multiple injection sites per site? So we didn't know really what the deal was at the beginning of this. We didn't know, we didn't quite understand why these positives were occurring. So uh, the National Pork Board sent out a request for proposals for researchers to apply for this research. So we wanted to look at the injection site volume, 10 cc's for, or versus 20 cc's. We wanted to look at injection site location, one location versus multiple locations and separating those injection sites. And then, or is it just simply a factor of withdrawal time? We're just not meeting the withdrawal time. So we looked from anywhere from seven to 40 days. And with this research, we wanted the researchers to look at exactly what FSIS was doing, use their KISS screening system so we could see how that compares to what we're doing and verify with this HPLC double mass spec method. So instead of boring you with all the details and whatnot, so we got halfway through the, the research and kind of some preliminary information came out says, well, it looks like if you put more than 10 cc's or 10 mils per volume, the, it doesn't absorb quite as well, so maybe it stays in the tissue a little bit longer. 
So we're going to have a recommendation of no more than 10 mils or cc's per injection site. And also the recommendation to separate injection sites by at least three centimeters or th uh, three inches, I mean, three inches. Because if you have a, injection sites are too close, you get too much of the product deposited in one location, which doesn't <clears throat> deplete very quickly. So looking at uh, volume in injection site and then separating those injection sites by at least three inches over multiple days. But the bottom line of the research was it really was a factor of withdrawal time. So it looks, it appears according to this research that the withdrawal time, it hangs up in the kidneys for an extended period of time. So the research shows that we need a 51 day withdrawal time to get our depletion down to zero. And that's specifically for kidneys. If you look at the other tissues that we sampled, that was sampled in this research, uh, a 12 day withdrawal time, especially for muscle, would be adequate enough. But since the kidneys, if you remember back, that KISS screen test is done on the kidneys, so that's what they're going to test first. So when you swab the kidneys, it's going to be positive out to 51 days through that KISS test. So the recommendation is if you use extra label dosage of penicillin and sows, you need a 51 day withdrawal time. So while this research has been is conducting changes in the air at FSIS, so in 2012, they revamped their national residue program completely. So if you look at the old method, <clears throat> they kind of have three different tiers on the left-hand side of the old method. You have your scheduled sampling, which is just your random sampling, your statistical sampling that they take on a daily basis, X number of animals or X number of tissues. You have your inspector-generated sample. So what that means is, is if you have a pig, we'll stick with the pig scenario. If you have a sow coming to market and she's got sores on her or she doesn't look like she's doing good, the FSI and suspector will look at her and say, all right, we need to test her because we think that there may be a residue violation just because she doesn't look good. It's all inspector generated, so it's up to their opinion if they want to sample it or not. They also sample imports. And then on the old method, what they would do when I put up their 300 samples per class is they would take um, 300 tissue samples for if they wanted to test for, let's say, penicillin. They would test 300 samples for penicillin, then they would test another 300 samples for ampicillin, another 300 samples for beta agonists and whatnot. So it was very labor intensive. It wasn't cost efficient. It was very uh, 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 archaic, so to speak. But the new method, there's three different tiers. You have the exposure assessment, which is the same as the old method. The inspector generated sample, which is the same. They had a third tier, which is targeted herd or flock testing. So what that means is, is if there's a producer out there that maybe have uh, multiple violations that uh, they would be targeted to sample a little bit more just to make sure they're not sending any other animals to market with violations. So they are going to start targeting herd or flock testing. And then again, they still have the import testing. And now they have, now they have a system called the multi-residue methodology where they can take one sample and test it for 52 analytes. So it's much more efficient, much more cost efficient, much more uh, flow through the laboratory. So they're, they're uh, streamlining their methods, so to speak, in 2012. But what is the important differences as it relates to pork producers is those inspector-generated tests, especially for sows, because that appears to be where our positives are occurring is those inspectors identifying those sows in the larage or in the holding pens that they think have residues getting tested. And then that multi-residue methodology where you could take one sample and test it over, they call it the uh, uh, compounds, all these 52 analytes that include antibiotics, sulfonamines, anti-inflammatories, beta agonists, and steroids. So this one sample goes to all these uh, 52 analytes. And they're trying, and FSIS is trying to increase the, the, the 52 analytes to get more and more testing methodologies in there. So here's the cascade of kind of what happens when there's uh, FSIS goes and tests. So whether it's inspector generated or just the random sampling or whatnot, they screen the kidneys with the KISS test. The KISS test comes back positive, and what that is, that's just a generic test. It doesn't tell you what it's positive for. What it tells you is there's something in there that lights up this test that there could be a residue violation. It doesn't mean there is, but there could be. So if there's a KISS test that comes back positive, then they take the kidney, the muscle, and the liver, and they send it to the FSIS regional laboratory. And then there, they run that 52 analyte test with the MRM, the multi-residue methodology plate. They do that on the kidney first, and that'll tell them exactly what they're looking for. And in the meantime, at the plant, the carcass and all the tissues need to be held because they can't send anything out there that may be adulterated or have a, 
a residue violation, a volatile positive. So if we stick with the penicillin and the sow example for this scenario, so then the MRM comes back positive for penicillin in the kidney. So then they run the muscle. And if those come back positive, they've got to confirm on that HPLC double mass spec. And if you remember, penicillin is a zero tolerance. So any type of level that they find on that HPLC, which measures the amount that's in there, is a violation. So if the kidney and muscle are both violative, the whole thing gets tanked. All the kidneys, all the offall, the carcass, everything gets, has to get thrown out the door. If the kidney is positive and the muscle is not, then the kidney gets tanked, and then the carcass can go on to normal food production. If both of them are non-volative, then both are okay, and then go down the normal routes of, of, of the food system. But the problem, it takes four to five days from that initial screen test until they get a positive identification back. And the problem with the sow industry is predominantly all sows are made for pre-rigger pork. So what that means is as soon as that sow is harvested, less than 30 minutes after she's harvested it, she goes into sausage production. So that's about 30 minutes from harvest to bratwurst, okay? And if you look, there's four to five days. These sow packers don't have the capacity or the uh, uh, areas to hold these carcasses more than 30 minutes. So to hold them for four or five days is not reasonable for them. So what do they end up doing if they get a kiss positive? They just tank the whole thing because they can't hold them. Whether it's a true positive or true violation or not, they can't hold them. So another concern is traceability issues. The way we market sows through consolidators and, and marketing channels is um, they have what they call these back tags. Back tags. So these back tags that these consolidators are glued onto the back of sows but the retention rate on those are at 15% at best. So 15% of those sows have some identification back to the producers. Why is this important? Because if there is a violation, FDA has to investigate why there is a violation. So they need trace back to either go talk to the producer or find out why there's a violation. So if there's no trace, if there's no traceability to the producer because there's no back tag, because there's only a 15% uh, retention rate on those tags, they go back to what we call the consolidators, where that, that they consolidate all these sows because each sow packer has their own criteria of what kind of sow they want. So these, uh, these consolidators market these sows based on the criteria of the sow packers. So producers take these sows to the consolidator, they get sorted off to different markets, whatever the criteria may be, and get paid that way. So if the pack tag falls off, the last point of concentration is the consolidator. So the FDA goes back to the consolidator and says, hey, according to these traceback records, you're the last point that we have, so we need to talk to you about antibiotic residue violations. Well, no, none, of, none of the consolidators give any antibiotics, so it's useless to have to go talk to them about antibiotic residue violations. So there's a traceback issue when these sows are positive. So what, what have we been working on? What has Pork Board, we're working with National Pork Producers Councils, AASV, the uh, antibiotic companies and whatnot. What are we doing? So we went and talked to FDA, and we said, what about establishing an edible to or a tolerance for edible tissues? Because like I said, beef has an edible tolerance of 50 parts per million. Poultry, turkeys, all that stuff, they do. Why can't pork? So they said, that should be easy enough. We could do that eventually. But the problem is that only reduced the withdrawal time down to 47 days. Whether it's 52 or 51 days or 47 days, that's very not practical for the pork production. So what's our other option? Well, can we go out there and establish a higher tolerance at 50 parts per million, knowing that we haven't seen any um, allergenicity issues in penicillin, people reacting from eating different types of meat with penicillin? Because that's a major concern when it comes to penicillin is allergenicity issues. Well, the FDA says you could spend millions and millions of money on your data withdrawal times, your tolerances, all that stuff, but the bottom line is the daily intake is probably not going to change, and you're not going to address the allergenicity issue, so you're going to spend millions and millions of dollars for us to tell you we're not going to give you a tolerance above 50 parts per million. So that's not an option. So what we did talk about is what if the sow packers or FSIS just declare sow kidneys as inedible? Because if you remember, that's where the penicillin is hung up. That's where we get our 51-day withdrawal time is the sow kidneys. So that would help our violations. So if, if a kiss came back positive on the kidneys, you tank the kidneys all right away, then they would test the muscle tissue, and you wouldn't get a violation because it would be a 12-day withdrawal time, as the research indicated. So that's an option that we're pursuing right now is we'll get the edible tissue tolerance at 50 parts per million like everybody else has, and then we're looking at if the sow packers or FSIS wants to declare sow kidneys as inedible, that'll help us with violations. 
So like I said, 51 or 47 days is really not practical. So then you look at alternatives right now because we haven't had the, uh, the, the tolerance established yet. The kidneys haven't been declared inedible yet. So what are the alternatives out there? Talking in the field, it seems like the, the majority are using, veterinarians and producers are using a, a product called Polyflex, which is an amp ampicillin-based product, right? Well, the only problem is, is there's no labeled use in the U.S. for ampicillin. There is in Canada, so we don't really know what the withdrawal time is for ampicillin. And ampicillin is a penicillin-based product. So there is, an, there is an established MRL. FDA has an established MRL for ampicillin and pork production, which is good. So we're not chasing zero again like we were with penicillin. But it is extra label usage. It's approved in Canada, like I said, but not in the U.S. But we really don't know what the withdrawal time is. So, again, check off is funding research through Iowa State. They uh, were awarded the grant to look at withdrawal time with ampicillin or the polyflex, just so we understand what that withdrawal time is so we don't get into another conundrum like we did with penicillin. So we're doing research to figure out that withdrawal time for ampicillin. So as I said, in 2012, they, uh, they changed their, their national residue program. So what I'm going to present on in the next couple slides after this one is just the violations after they implemented the new withdrawal or the new residue program. Because if you look before, the pork industry was pretty good. In fact, FSIS was talking about not sampling pork for a while because they couldn't find any residue violations for a long time. Well, that has changed a little bit. So, uh, based on our industry, what's, what, who do they test in the pork industry? So they have four different types of categories that they lump us in. There's a boar stag category that they test, a market hogs, roaster pigs, and sows. And we're not the only ones. The beef industry, they've got cold dairy cows, they've got veal calves. They've got about six or seven different categories. But I just wanted to pull up, here's what they're testing as it relates to our industry for violations. So, after they implemented the new system, here's the first quarter of that new system, and here's the violations that have come out. So boars and stags, no residue violations, that's good. Roaster pigs, no residue violations. Market hogs were still, uh, they test about 1,600 market hogs uh, in this quarter. So we have three that had penicillin violations and one sulfa violation, which is good. That's only four violations compared to the other market commodities out there. And if you look at the sow industry, that's where we see the increased penicillin residue violations. So we have 45 penicillin, three sulfas, and one gentamicin. So that was the first. If you look on FSIS's website, that's the first quarter that they reported this new national residue program. And here's the last set of, of data that they have. So they only have two quarters up there right now, this previous one and then this one of 2013. So again, boars and stags and roaster pigs, no residue violations. We're doing good on that part. Market hogs are down to one penicillin violation. And if you look at sows, we have fewer penicillin violations, so we only have 19. We have one ampicillin, so maybe, maybe the withdrawal time is not adequate for ampicillin, so this research needs to get finished and we can get the communication of the research and withdrawal time out there quicker. And then we have a safety fear, which I heard is another alternative to what some people may be using to penicillin, and then a zero and all. So those are our sow violations right now. Fewer violations the second quarter of what's been posted out there. And what we've been doing, uh, we've got a couple fact sheets out there. Uh, they're back at our trailer now if you'd like to go back and get them. Looking at proper injection sites for, to avoid violative residues in sows. And then um, we've also got a fact sheet looking at the roaster pigs and lightweight pigs in case you market those at a, at a lighter weight and what you need to be careful for and look for to avoid violative residues.